Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm John. And this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. Uh, as always, we're socially distanced. We did it before it was ever mandatory or cool or annoying to some people. But um, Ross is still in the Northeast. I'm in the Midwest. And John is in New Mexico. So we're still three time zones. But tonight, all three time zones butt up against each other. <laughs> Almost got the full spread back. <laughs> yeah, normally the guest is on the Pacific time. So that's why we, uh, we've hopped mountain quite a bit. So, oh. um, yeah. Hopped Mountain uh, sounds like the, Hopped Mountain is an IPA from a brewery in Denver. <laughs> I'm sure it exists. And I bet it's not Denver based. I bet it's like some Probably. small, like. It's like Fort Collins. Yeah, Fort Collins. Yeah, I was, <laughs> it's like. I was trying to come up with a Colorado city oh, that I was like, wait, I know too many well, people in Colorado cities that I'm going to insult somebody. So isn't, that John did. isn't fat tire, <laughs> isn't I, fat tire from Fort Collins? Yeah. 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 It's new Belgium. Yeah. 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 I'm actually, they got bought out by somebody else. Yeah, they AB. did. I drink this yeah. like hop lark stuff, which is like sparkling water with uh, hops in it. Mm-hmm. And I, I always was like a, a bourbon strictly drinker. I didn't really drink a whole lot of beer, but since I quit drinking, like, what it's like seven years ago all i've craved for the past two years is like really hoppy stuff like interesting i'll I'll finish up a big mountain bike ride and i'm like my friends will be drinking an ipa and i'm like shit like why do i want an ipa (laughs) on this stuff and it's been great but yeah yeah, so apparently these guys left new belgium and started like this sparkling water company huh good for them interesting that stuff's coming up quick so oh, yeah. Misty Mountain Hop IPA does exist, but they're based out of Virginia. Oh, uh, well, isn't yeah? Misty so. Mountain is in, or isn't that a thing? In, never mind. Continue. That's a Tolkien. <laughs> very <laughs> off topic. Yeah. I think it's a Tolkien reference. Uh, right, the Misty Mountain. Oh, the Misty Mountains. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's fair. That makes more sense. <laughs> Big <Tolkien laughs> over here. <laughs> really? That's very surprising for a guy who likes to spend a lot of time outdoors and bike bikes. <laughs> Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't pin that to Virginia, though. That's not. No, no. I mean, Tolkien references aren't anywhere. It's Middle Earth. Like, yeah, yeah. But still, I mean, Virginia is not. Any, I'll, I'll shut my mouth before I say something. Right <laughs> it's all right. I saw a map the other day that had Virginia associated with the Northeast and not the South. And yeah, that, that is the, below the Mason Dixon line. Yeah, <laughs> the anger of people in the comment section were also they had Texas in the Southwest. And I was like, Texas yeah, is oh, standalone. I Texas saw that. Did not go anywhere. That was on that two um, states in the Southwest: Arizona yeah. and New Mexico. New Mexico, that, Colorado dude, is practically the Midwest, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of culture, and like California and Nevada and like Utah. That's you know, California's west. Yep, Nevada's yeah. west. It's all about what are the two states on the southern border. So Chris, Texas I, is Texas technically was in the Confederacy, so I'll give Texas to the south, but Kentucky mm-hmm. is not part of the Confederacy and is above the Mason Dixon line. So technically that is the Midwest. As much as people want to hate or I guess that, the East Coast or <laughs> yeah. the, the funny part of the, <laughs> the argument was people arguing which half of Kentucky <coughs> went which direction. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, I mean boy. like growing up in North Carolina. Like, you know, Kentucky was always, I mean, in our opinion was like, yeah, bourbon came from there, but you couldn't really buy bourbon in Louisville. We'd go up to Louisville for like hardcore metal shows and stuff, Mm -hmm. but it's like, you're above the Mason Dixon line and you're basically like your biggest event of the year just fills with New Yorkers. Like (laughs) (laughs) the rest of the year, you're just like Ohio. You know, it's like, it's I like had thought of the Man. Kentucky Derby yeah. as like yeah. a tourist Seriously. destination for oh, New yeah. Yorkers. That's it's awesome. like, like Burning Man versus what is actually happening out there during every I mean, other day of the year. Yeah, it's literally the same shit. It's like mm-hmm. white people putting on costumes and like acting like they're something they're not. <laughs> yep. yep. The hat industry <laughs> loves it though. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. You got it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. In the mint julep industry. So <laughs> like, what? Like, it's like the water. mint julep industry. What the fuck is yeah. that? It's yeah. the drink of the Kentucky Bur- uh, or Kentucky uh, uh, Derby. If you go, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm never gonna go. So yeah. I wait, I don't wait to go it. once. I mean, it, it'd be a cool thing to go to and like just document people, but 
Yeah, I'm, I'm down know, for some people watching. Just satire on them. Yeah. Oh, so fancy. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is, it's like you don't want to. I don't know. It's never fun to shoot people that want to be shot. You know, it's like better right. to shoot mm-hmm. places. Like my favorite events were always like the. Can, hold on, uh, can you can you constitute what shoot people means for the people listening so they're not actually like. Feet. Yeah. Photography. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm not worried for the well being of Kentucky Derby goers. Yeah, no. I, the only gun I have is like a pellet gun, and I use it to kill squirrels. So that's, that's pretty much it. That's, that's the biggest megafauna I've ever taken down with a gun. So, yeah. But yeah, there's, there's like the, that balance of like going somewhere to document the insanity of something and, and going somewhere just to like take people's future like Instagram profile photos or something yeah. like that. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. It's different. Oh. oh, man. Well, sweet. Um, in, into the regular format of the show, um, Ross, you wanted to skip all of yours, you said? Uh, yeah, I drove a um, a forest, not a forest, or Jesus Christ, a uh, cross track. Cross track. A new cross track. <laughs> uh, cl- close enough. Very good car. Uh, not really much to say about it other than it's a very good car. And there will be words probably on Universe for it sometime soon. Probably. Soon, maybe, hopefully. Uh yeah, the, the, the Crosstrek is like actually really good now. Um, you know, enthusiasts and myself included are still doing the dance about like, give it a turbo and a stick. But like, <laughs> that would be 0.5 of the buyer market. We, we literally power. had Subaru on and discussed yes. that point. They sell oh, wow. every one they make. They're not going to make a to your version. completely forgot. <laughs> what, what was that? It was his name, Scott. That was uh, uh, Todd Hill Todd, of Todd Subaru Hill. America. Who's Scott? Why am I thinking? Yeah, Todd Hill. Um, who I met Scott at the auto Allen show. Scott is Jeep. Actually, Scott Allen. Yeah, I met I met Todd Hill at the auto show a few months after that. Uh, but yeah, the Crosstrek is actually genuinely good. Uh, it rides better than a bunch of luxury cars I've driven. And yeah, then that left, and I had the Mercedes GLC 300, which is fine. It, it's so I. I always shorten GLC, so I call that one the Glock. The it's Glock. the Mercedes Benz Glock. Can we call it the GLC? Can we call it the Glock? <laughs> the Glocker. <laughs> you you would have to run that uh, past our editor. Well, and yeah. and, and, Podcasting. Uh, the GLE is the Glee, and then Glee. the GLA is obviously the Glock. Mm. So. <laughs> and the Gluss, and the what about like the they AM, named them phonetically? It's easy. The AMG <laughs> GTC or the GTR. Which I refer to as the alphabet soup. So we're good. Ah, like yeah, we got enough, it all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this new GLC, is it, it's very nice. It rides great. Um, it's got that like mild hybrid thing that Mercedes is doing with all their cars. And actually got pretty good gas mileage. I think it was like in the high 20s over the week I had it. Which for something like that and for the driving I do, which is mostly around town, is pretty solid. Um and what else did I drive? Drove an Alpha Tonale, which we'll talk about potentially in the future. Potentially. And yeah, I got my need rock, to talk Alpha first. My rock sliders as of this recording are 90% of the way there. I So you figured out we did discuss the hardware issue and the, we that discussed, was on the show, right? Yeah, I've that had was, a weird that was five days. So. Last week with my brother when I I admitted my fuck up and apologized to White Knuckle Off Road. Um, and then <laughs> And then finally got my shit together and figured out exactly what I was supposed to be doing with the stuff that they sent that I didn't realize was the stuff they sent and proceeded to lose the nut that goes on the back of the screw that pushes the KDSS and brake line away from the frame so that you can get the U-bolt around to bolt the slider on. Um, The screws are there, but the lock nuts there, the washers there, but the actual nut is had vanished from the existence of my house. I checked everywhere. So I had to go to Home Depot and get a replacement. And uh, now, okay. now I'm it just wasn't in the it. materials that they resent you. No, I used that for something. I used that other nut for something else. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's a good chance it went down the drain in my driveway. But uh, yeah, and now I'm just waiting for it to not be 100 degrees at 92% humidity. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's been the last today was like 96 and like 93 percent humidity uh, september yeah. so you went on a much yeah, more exciting trip. here yeah i so i started 
my week with a week of triple digits, basically. Like it was a hundred plus for yeah, a solid week. Sent it east. And then it dropped and we had a very delightful week. And then at the end of last week, it started to go back up to the mid nineties again. Um, and so we decided to run away from that and we drove out. I have a, a friend who has purchased some land uh, out in a tiny Colorado town that I had never been to before uh, in a region of Colorado we'd never explored before. Um, so much of my stuff has been across, I, for lack of a better term, the I-70 corridor. So like if mm -hmm. it was off I-70, it was super easy to get to. And so we have, we've done a lot of that section of Colorado. And so it was very interesting to drop south, um, leaving I-70 way sooner than we normally do. We actually left I-70 in the state of Kansas still. Mm -hmm. Um, so Cut we were, off. we traveled to Pagosa Springs which is basically, for lack of a better term, South Central Colorado. And it feels like it's 50 to 100 miles from the New Mexico border. Like, it is mm -hmm. not far away. A town um, that you had never been to and that I had never heard of. Right. Like, and only like 20 miles from the New Mexico border. Is that all it is? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It it definitely felt <clears throat> different. Um, is hold it, on, I got to show... I, I'm just going to do my my road images, Ross, that I sent you. Yeah, the, the road image is good. So what elevation is Pagosa Springs at, roughly? 7,000. Yeah. It's, okay, so it's... It's, like it's the same elevation as Santa Fe. Okay. Yeah. So, like, you're up there, but you're not up there. Like, we've spent so much time at 9,000 feet that we're like, all right, cool, 9,000 feet. But as soon as we go to 10,000 feet, half the family is like, I don't feel good anymore. So as we try nine, typically, like, 9,500 is typically our max. Um, so... When we left I-70, we left I-70 in Oakley, Kansas and headed across US-40 West, which is what you're seeing here for the audio listener. Um, it's nothing like it's just planes. There's some telephone, electrical poles, and that's it. Or as we conversed via Slack, not even cows. No, not even cows. No, not enough cows to, <laughs> to like have a market reference. So this was this section of road was four hours from leaving Oakley, Kansas, I-70 to reaching a something, actually crossing under I-25 um, in front of the mountains. So like it is forever long to the point where I took this picture about two and a half, three hours into that drive. And it looks the exact fucking same. Like there's more sagebrush, but that's about it. Very there, pretty. Ross, is it? I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm looking at out here, so. Right, like you got trees and hills and this is it. Don't get me wrong, like the road was very well kept. It flowed. I was able to allegedly run just a little higher than five over um, and not have much braking or anything. But like it did make me feel like driving out farther west. Um, and some of those unpopulated area where you're like, oh, I'm approaching a truck. I need to pass. Oh, I can see for 17 miles. So <laughs> let me go ahead and pull out now. Who cares mm -hmm. that it's. No, I did only pass in passing zones, but like there were clearly some times where I was like. I shouldn't be passing here, but I can see the road forever. So we're just going to go ahead and do it now. So it, the drive out was uh, a different drive. We've done 12 hour drives before with the kids. They were pretty good, um, but they started to get tired after a while. And I just, we had, uh, a, we, we met my friend and his wife out there. We had a great time with them. We went mountain biking the first day. Um, and full disclosure, like not a, not a massive guy. Like I have the mountain bike. I definitely don't have all of the kit that I, I mean, I had gloves and a helmet and a bike, like cool. That's um, all you need. Like literally that is all you need. <laughs> Right. Seriously, like and I, people overthink that stuff. Like you don't have to wear like Fox and Troy Lee head to toe. Like I literally yeah. ride with cutoffs in a t-shirt. And, yeah. and my and friends have wear with invested all in their bikes yeah. where yeah. mine is like, I put on handles and pedals because I needed actually more room for my giant feet. Um, and I wanted a little thinner <laughs> pedal because the it sounds weird to say the stock pedals kept hitting rocks. No, I mean, yeah, like stock pedals on anything are going to be kind of garbage. It's like, yeah, so always nice. The good contact points is what we call that. Contact. Those are your contacts. Yeah. Good to upgrade. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. And hopefully, we did your your hopeful contact points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, I it, they're generally in contact. Like I don't, I'm not wild enough yeah. to, 
or I'm not out of control like enough to be wild frame, enough. Frame, to... bars, tires, not contact points. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we did we we did just kind of a, a chill ride. They had a, a they had found a, a trail in town that like it was a fairly easy uphill for me and my 12 year old who are not used to mountain elevation. And then it was a nice flow down. And so we did that loop a couple times on Saturday. Um, and then I was winded and actually had my tire back tire was losing air, which didn't help us continue to ride, um, which is more about maintenance before we got there, as opposed to like something we did drive ride through a bunch of like shattered glass a couple of times. And I was like, that seems shitty. Um, Not good and the second, I weirdly, <laughs> I didn't take any pictures while mountain biking because mountain biking like my my hands were involved like i'm not good enough to do that like yep. i'm sure there's some guy and i don't have the like gopro chest harness so um <laughs> the second day we went up to like a reservoir and did paddle boarding and stuff and this is where like i started to be like are we in glacier because the vibes it gives off from like the lakes and stuff from when i was up in montana are kind of similar hmm. down here in that like it's it's basically a big valley and then there are peaks everywhere Those are um, trees. which is a lot like being up a glacier yeah lots the, of trees the trees look significantly for like they're from significantly further north than you actually were so they're giant ponderosa pines yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah that pretty much that whole like san juan mountain corridor up into like the sangres all the way down to our backyard it's all ponderosa hmm. we've got a lot of yeah. doug fir and blue spruce too but yeah yeah that whole is, like that's... like that zone is all smells like caramel in the rain you know it's dude like, it smells delightful <laughs> yeah like i got out of the car and that was the first thing i noticed i was like there was a breeze and so you get that sound of wind through pines which is like top five yeah. sound for me love it the smell of the the fucking you get up close to the ponderosas they smell like vanilla Dude, like i th that's something that we have actually talked about on the show before like you talk about you know visiting and travel and adventure and it's always like the sights and the experiences but the smell of different places like the smell from May, middle Maine to Eastern New Hampshire, which aren't that far apart. Like there's a distinct smell and it's so it's like a whole body bring you back kind of thing. Once you get it, it's great. I love that. It's so underappreciated. It, 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 it was great. And so the second day we went out to the reservoir that I just had the photo up. We did a couple of paddle boards and a, an inflatable two person kayak. I am not a stand-up paddleboard guy, being that I'm a little short of 6'4 and 200-ish pounds. Like a stand-up paddleboard is terrifying to me. And I've never had good balance. Um, so I did do it with the kids quite a bit. Actually, way more balance than I expected because I didn't realize they had massive fins on them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I just hadn't messed with it. To me, as like someone who's not good with balance stuff, like bikes and paddleboards are terrifying to me. And that's all I did this weekend. <laughs> so... Um, Good day paddle boarding. I definitely showed up my Little League tan and that I don't take my shirt off much. And so wearing a <laughs> white jacket, having my blazing white biceps uh, exposed. And actually, right when we got there, it like oh, pop up rainstormed on us and then like put one side in the mountains and rain and one side in the sun. It just it was a great day. It was very chill. Um, and we drove home yesterday. So we were only out there for a couple of days and drove back just because timing was you were we, we smashed up in and. My wife and I joke like we're not afraid of a road trip, but like this was 12 hours out and back with only a couple of days in between was, was pretty steep. And so we did see some amazing gas mileage on the way back out of the Suburban. Cheating. Um, I know I joke about getting 20 or 21 sometimes. And like I saw 24 miles to the gallon in the Suburban coming down out of the hills. We definitely had a tailwind across eastern Colorado like. When Cheating. I filled up, I was, we were still in the high country when I filled up. I've been over one of the passes and the range when I filled up said 654 miles. Hell yeah. And then I looked at like the distance to home and it was only like 620 miles home. And I was like, that's too close to play with that. But if the kids weren't here, it'd be a big maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah if you were so, carrying but I only had like, I literally, I filled up. What was that, Ross? If you were carrying a thousand pounds less on board. And really, we didn't pack that heavy, and we just had the two bikes hang off the back. So, like arrow wise, we were we were pretty good. I did lower both the bike seats because like they were sticking up above the rear, the mm. roof, and I was like, well, I'm gonna tuck those down, so I'm eliminating some drag. 
I don't know if that helped or not. Those bike seats are not very big and they're pretty low profile. Actually um, added downforce, kept the back end on. Yeah. <laughs> Race car. Maybe that's why those, uh, that two, two lane road in Eastern Colorado, <laughs> Western Kansas was so easy to navigate. Um, oh. but no, it, it, absolutely is a place that we want to go back and visit obviously we're going to since my friend is moving there um it was it was it was really cool uh, we just like the whole vibe like it actually had we always joke about like the size of the town and like what grocery store is there like are we talking safeway is it a city market am i getting a king super if it's it's a massive town if it has a walmart right so like it it had a city market and a walmart so i was like that's pretty good sized town like we had a cell signal the whole time we were there like in 2021, the population of Pagosa Springs was 1,631 people. Right. So it's like three to five full, three to five thousand full time residents, and then everything else is seasonal. They do have a ski resort for winter sports, and then the the winter sports resort doesn't open for like Breckenridge runs mountain bike trails during the summer, right? Like it's not, it hasn't done that yet, but there is a lot of uh, trails in the area. Um, it's it, Ross it was so low key. Like I will, I will say like, it's full of a lot of Texicans right now. Cause it's mm-hmm. super easy for them to get from Texas up there. Like mm-hmm. fucking worst. <laughs> <laughs> There's Texas, a reason I said Texicans and not Texans. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, my wife is from Texas and we both like, that's the worst part about living in Santa Fe. I'm like, yeah. God, damn. Like you say, you definitely speak from experience. <laughs> Oh my god! I mean, I lived in Austin for five years, which is like not really Texas. I mean, it kind so of least Texas all, alternate Texas there is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> alternate. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's it's <laughs> like yeah, it's a really hard. It's a really hard. Uh, I don't like stereotyping an entire people, right. but yeah, fuck that. <laughs> fuck that. Right. Well, right. and yeah. it's like all, all your my- ideologies that like your state upholds have resulted in zero public land. So you have to come and recreate in our fucking States and then fucking <laughs> act, want us to act like we're, we're like beholden to your weird Texas values. Like, no, go yeah. home. It's easy. Go, go home. <laughs> no one likes you. Well, that's like Pardon Texas listeners, but like, you know, there's some truth there. <laughs> all, yeah. all of the other places I've been in Colorado, uh, typically if I run into some kind of issue, there's a Texas plate in front of me. Yeah. So like just being here, there are way more of them and they've switched. It used to be like a red, white, and blue plate. Now it's like a white plate with black letters yeah. and they were everywhere. Yeah. It's so, like, you're, you're literally like camping in the middle of nowhere, right? Tiny little pull out, you know, just I'll park the cruiser, like just like, you know, out, out off of a bit of double track. You'll wake up in the morning and some jabroni, has like driven his Dodge Ram with his fucking 70 foot mini house behind him because he's afraid to camp with like six side by sides. And they're like doing donuts in like an Alpine Lake or like, a, or an Alpine like bog. And yeah. like there's trash and toilet paper everywhere. And there's a fire going at seven in the morning when there's a burn ban. And you have to walk over and explain to someone the concept of public land and being responsible. Like, yeah. Like, no. Wow. Nope, nope, nope. What's sad is I was able to picture all of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like some some dipshit, you know, side by side, like hooting and hollering and doing donuts in like microbial, like right. eco yes. that took in like thousands of years to form. And yeah. is like the most delicate thing that you could find for a hundred miles. And he's, nope, got to go do donuts in his side by side. Like, no. Sorry, I can go on about yeah. that a whole yeah. episode. <laughs> hey, I'm deep in that culture, and I went on a tirade about that a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, no I think that was last here. week too. Actually, it's back to back weeks of that. No, like whatever happened to just like driving the fucking car that you drove to go outdoors in on trails, and like, why does everyone have to tow like twelve vehicles with them? It's like so right. weird. Yeah, the power like, sports yeah. industry is a mind of its own. Dude, every time I thought I was going to pass a semi on that, like the two lane section, it was just a giant HD pickup with a fifth wheel behind it. Like just, they look like semis from a distance as they're approaching you on those small ass roads. Yeah. 
it's uh it's one that is one of the gnarliest sections of highway from pagosa to like chama new mexico yeah because of that exact reason and it's like uh it's a really narrow road and, and new mexico's roads are a special kind of horrible um but i think they might have just repaved that section which is like nice but yeah you just you can't pass these guys and like they see you yeah. passing them and they take it as some affront to their masculinity and right. they like you know that and the road going into moab from yes rango is like very very similar like archetypal uh yeah just to forest. it's funny you mentioned that because that's the the my friend lives in salt lake so that's the road he had to come down <laughs> and go back up yeah. yeah he's like they like to get to moab for lunch because that's better spots than obviously there's not much in green river so oh uh, yeah yeah there's only yeah. so many i can't oh, yeah. remember the name of the the family-owned taco stand there that but yeah green river's got some got some character though when it's yeah when, it does but when it's not melon season i mean what you know it's like you pretty much just got to be there for melon season but get out yeah <laughs> dude moab's well, got better like japanese food than we do in santa fe it's like pretty crazy yeah we don't have shit in santa fe it's like you can eat new mexican food all day but if you want anything else good luck uh, i'm not gonna lie there's, there's i could eat mexican every single day oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so gloria being the, my favorite part about being in the midwest is we've actually got nobody nobody knows this is like there's actually quite a collection of people like they've all kind of like yeah. migrated into them like everyone thinks it's flyover and we're like totally fine that's fine like keep our yeah. population down but like the amount of food that we're able to try here in kc is pretty great yeah yeah i, I mean, it's, live yeah. in the greater new york city area so yeah yeah i know you're, you're gonna stick to your guns it's totally yep. fine ross i've been there it's fine our, our food <laughs> is different yep yeah and it's, and which is my favorite part is it's literally the fucking same <laughs> it's the same but it's it's cooked by people who are better at cooking anyways i will say new york new york definitely has some banger food places like yeah like like the the uh kolache place i used to go to i lived in greenpoint when i lived there oh really was like insane like they were not kolaches what were they oh man i'm gonna i can't believe i'm blanking on this the polish dumplings when were you in greenpoint uh i moved to new york in 2004 and left in left 2010 okay um you're in greenpoint yeah, kolaches is the texas thing that, that's like the pierogi pierogi there you go yeah i mean like pierogies are like the tie spot downstairs from my architecture office like just yeah and mm -hmm. la had great food too but it's oh, like new great. york like you can just walk down a block and there's you're traveling the world in terms of like food yeah diversity. new york you throw a, a dart or you know like a bag of dog shit from the sidewalk and you find a good place to eat <laughs> like yeah. la you gotta drive or seek it out yeah no you literally yeah. have to drive there's no other of transportation in la <laughs> you yeah. could get driven unless you're lucky if you're lucky enough to live in like uh you know, small, like Silver Lake was like an awesome place. Like we would walk pretty much everywhere or ride bikes like, a, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if, if you, God forbid you live in like center city and, you know, you have to commute to like East Hollywood or, you know, Santa Monica, like you're sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's three hours of your day gone sitting oh, on your God. ass in your car. Man. Where like yeah. Google Maps says it's seven miles away. Why does the time yeah. to destination say four hours? Dude, I yeah. mean, to would literally start be, walking. Yeah. It's like faster to ride a bike in LA than it is to drive places. We are like, a yep. show about driving, basically, right? Whether it's yeah. trucks or SUVs or quads or rally cars or bikes, and like working from home and not having to commute is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and we both work from home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We're, we're like class one fucking hypocrites here. I, I mean, we drive our stuff off the road. We do do things, Ross. I know. Bad. I know. I'm just. I'm, I'm just trying to ruin shitter. the show on episode. I'm whatever. just being a shitter. Oh man. Anyways, let's uh, let's let's talk, let's talk about John. Stuff. Talk about John. Let's talk some <laughs> Radivus stuff. What uh, pressure? What have you been up no to? No pressure. Really? Oh man, yeah. That's a that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> Well, Chris I pointed just, out that our, our last show with you was in 2020. 
So yeah, it's been you were a episode twenty. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So um, I sold my company in 2021 to a company in Colorado that sells certified pre-owned bikes, kind of like. Hmm. Just trying to change the the model of ownership for for bicycles, kind of in a similar way that we would look at cars, you know, mm -hmm. um, like buying a used car. Like, I've never owned a new car, so I understand. I think that model like really resonates. Yeah, they, you know, is that time in the industry a lot of? I mean, it's pretty much the entire economy. Like, you know, a bull market lasted for since basically 2010, and um, there was just a lot of money and and a lot of uh, e-commerce. Companies were looking for ways to grow like storytelling branches of their brand. And, and that one option is to grow it endemically. The other option is to basically buy an established, um, mm -hmm. you know, storytelling platform. And so yep. uh, the, the company's called the Pros Closet and they bought the Radivis in 2021. And so for the past two years, we've just been kind of like in this like ideal place where we, they don't have a whole lot to say in our editorial day to day. Um, they're mostly just like do cool stuff mm -hmm. and it makes the brands look good. That's and awesome. that's pretty much it. So it was like, like the first year we had like a million dollar budget to do all this, like really fun stuff and, um, video projects and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously the, that bull market has now ended. Yeah, so sure. like the bike industry, like many industries is, uh, kind of contracting and regressing back to the 2018, 2019, uh area so um you know with that said like don't have as much money to do fun stuff anymore but mm -hmm. we're still we're still doing a lot of really in my opinion like great projects um i just got back from portland oregon last week where there was like a big handmade bicycle show like guys that guys and girls and everything in between that basically like people that just make bike frames mm -hmm. and um you know display them and i shot 50 bikes and oh, then wow. my coworker josh shot another 30 um yeah this is this guy my friend jay has a little jdm uh toyota awesome uh, fire truck that he served coffee out of but yeah so we just basically spent the entire weekend shooting bikes and um hmm. catching up with people it's kind of like a family affair like a lot of these frame builders i i see more than i see my own family and it was in this really beautiful venue called the uh, Zidal Yards, which wow. was a basically like a boat, like a shipbuilding factory for a century. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think the last ship set sail, or uh, not set sail, but you know, was was yeah. jettisoned in 2017. So there's about a hundred years worth of industry like clinging to each like little rivet and that's awesome. The concrete floors like kind of disgustingly coated with a. Uh, um, you know, oil and all this like industrial remnants and then displayed in this hall are, are just a bunch of really nice, you know, U.S. made bicycles and components. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like reflecting on, you know, what it meant to make things in America and then what's happened through like globalization and exporting all of our production overseas mm -hmm. to third world countries because late capitalism. And, um, right. and, and there's still like this, this group of people in this like tiny little subsect of a big industry that make handmade bikes. And so it's kind of like, yeah, this is like a bike that a friend of mine made That's for awesome. another friend of mine who has a coffee shop. And so this is like, yeah, we've, we've had Taylor on the show. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Roll <laughs> yeah. Holy coffee. yeah. So yeah. we didn't have him on for coffee. It was back way long ago when he was still with GoFest. So. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 So the funny, one of the funniest text threads of, uh, I, I, of recent memory is <laughs> Taylor sending me a selfie driving from Bozeman, like across Eastern Oregon to Portland. And it's like sun, you know, golden hour, like face all illuminated by the setting sun. See you soon, homie. Can't wait. I'm like, sweet dude. Like, can't wait to see you. Like found a good spot to shoot your bike, blah, 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 blah. Five minutes later, Shit, I think I broke or I think I blew my rear main seal. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh he has like, terrible breaker. luck with vehicles. I mean, Seriously. he only buys like 40 year old shit boxes. Yeah, he's a mess. Like, oh, guilty man. here, too. But like, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I so have, he's like, 
I, I have two questions. My first question is this show you went to and, and shot all these bikes at, is this the kind of thing where it's like local, regional, you know, or international it's in, like, there's people coming from all over for this thing. Yeah. That's Namibia. Awesome. Yeah. That's like cool. literally a frame builder from Namibia. Namibia. Was there. Whoa. Namibia. Yeah. Wow. And, and his name's so Dan cool. and he's, uh, his brand is Unguza. Um, and you know, he's got like a, Land Rover and a Land Cruiser, and you know Namibia is like a huge, like kind of like four by four touring place too. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but Nguza's they basically just started making bike frames for the local, the, just for the locals to like go to races, and like they go to these races and just destroy everyone. Mm. Like there, there's just this like endurance that I think is you know sa- same thing that was happening with like you know track runners and stuff. Or yeah. Um, but yeah, this this team is yeah they're kind of like the new hot thing in cycling um and then there's yeah there's builders from kind of all over the country all over the world um companies from all over the world and i think people probably flew in from all over the world to see it because it's literally like the world really looks at american frame building for it's you know kind of like whatever's going to happen um in the in, in that like little zone of the bike industry ever since like Tom Ritchie was making like the first mountain bikes with like Joe Breeze and those people. Um, yeah. So it's like pretty, pretty cool. Like if you're, if you're tangentially interested in bikes, I'd say it's probably about a two hour experience for you. If you're like super bike nerd, it's like a four day thing and you don't see everything. How how many people show up to something like this? I think, I think they had like, so it's only open Saturday and Sunday, and I think they had probably six thousand people both days. Whoa! Wow! Yeah. Oh man! Yeah, that's okay. Like that's, yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's show. a lot of people. That's a real yeah. Show. It's also in Portland, which is like a bike that city in general. So. Kind of almost like, like a mecca. bike culture yeah. center of the country, right? I mean, I, it's hard because I think Portland like doesn't do it for me because I don't really like road riding and there's not like mountain biking in town so and like it's not really safe to ride road bikes anymore just because it's just not like covid really fucked that up so i i think for commuting and like infrastructure it's great but it's also a pretty rainy wet city so like you got to have fenders and rain Mm -hmm. gear and i don't know for me it's like an ideal and this is going to be super controversial but an ideal bike (laughs) for me I think New York City is a is a great bike city. I think the infrastructure that they've Oof. that they've made um, over the past ten years is like great, like greatly improved its bike friendliness. Yes. And then LA is an incredible place to ride any kind of bike. Um, so hmm. like road bike, mountain bike, gravel bike. There's so much stuff to ride in, in the mountains of Los Angeles that, and no one lives in LA for the outdoors. They all live there for like the, the beach that they move. never go to. <laughs> Yeah, the beach that's a three hour drive. I you, know you, multiple you both were so kind because I was gonna say they just live there for the bullshit, but you both were yeah. much kinder. Well, I, I know multiple I mean, people who live who moved to LA to have beach access and have still to this day never been to the beach. Yeah. I mean LA is the mountain town that Boulder wishes it was. And like that's gonna trigger a lot of people, but I'm like, okay, sea level to ten thousand feet. And every, every activity that is found at those elevation changes is, is like right at your fingertips. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really crazy. Like there's, it, there are very few places in the world, like Los Angeles, like geographically speaking. So you can ride your bike from sea level up. Well, at at certain point you would hit an illegal bike trail and you would have to ride your bike illegally on the bike trail, which I'm not saying you should, but. (laughs) might be kind of fun if you did it. Um, you could ride up to Mount Baldy, like up to the top of Mount Baldy. And it's like, and you'll see three people. And like one of them is like a park ranger and the other is like a oh, Audubon yeah. society person. <laughs> so it's like versus Boulder. Like you can't even ride your bike on certain trails, certain days of the week. And when you do go out on a hike or a run, you see thousands of people and the parking lots full. And it's, it's like, once it becomes that saturated with like mm-hmm. like-minded people, I think the experience goes out the window. The experience that you're looking for goes out the window. The actualized experience changes from the 
desired experience. Yeah. It's like going to Moab during Easter Jeep Safari and like hoping to get some peace and quiet. Yeah. Or like what people think they're going to see when they go to like the Empire State Building. Like, oh my God, no, you're just getting yeah. slammed into from every side. Yeah, exactly. And that, you know, obviously like, I don't know, I live in a town of 80,000 people. So I kind of like low density. And that that's what was funny with Pagosa Springs is there's not just now. this like imaginary, <laughs> imaginary line too that happens like between Colorado and New Mexico. And no one comes down to New Mexico. And it's and it's amazing for us that live here because like like we rode from uh, we rode the Continental Divide Trail this summer, which is starts oh, wow. way the fuck up. We we just rode the section basically just over the Colorado border down to Martinez Canyon. It's it's all single track. I think we saw like probably four people total, and two of them were also touring the route. Mm-hmm. So we were just out fishing and, you know, friend, two of my friends were pulled elk tags for the area. So they were kind of like kind of semi scouting some zones to like set up. And, um, yeah, we saw no one and, mm-hmm. and fished and caught, caught more trout in like two hours this one morning that I've caught all year. And, <laughs> and, um, yeah. And there's just that like vast, emptiness where you just don't see people because it's like it requires you to get out of your car and Isn't walk it great it's so great <laughs> that's why the, that's why the bicycle is just like such a amazing vehicle for like exploration and yeah. independence and everything it's like, yeah i mean it's hard you're above ten thousand feet pretty much that whole ride so but um yeah was was, was cool. mitchell involved in this mitchell connell Oh, no, no, not in that trip. No, no. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was like, yeah. I found one on Radivus talking about Great Divide Trail. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I figured the images would be similar. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we have a, we just got a new uh, refrigerator and it's loud when it makes stuff. Can't hear it. Can't hear it. So you're good. Um, okay, I want to back up for a second. So <laughs> with you having sold Radivus, other than the infusion of ad spending, how has your role and the company changed over that time? Honestly, it hasn't. I think I th- is that, I th- and that's what you wanted, right? That's I don't know. What I'm putting I'm words in your mouth here, you know, <laughs> but like, you know, I think it's like a mix of, you know, like I joked that there was so much fake money being thrown around in 2021, where it was like, oh, like credit. Yeah, we're like basically the board of directors tells a company to, Hey, you got to do this thing. And the company goes and does it. Mm-hmm. And I think, I don't know for certain, but I'm assuming that a similar thing happened with this TPC Radivus merger where they were like, Oh, we have to go out and we have, we're going to buy a media company. And, um, and, and I think it's like, I, I know the founder of the company like was really tuned into what I was doing like professionally with the website. And I think he was probably a big supporter of uh, TPC purchasing the Radivus. But I think there was like this, this thing where like you catch like a big fish and you don't really know how to land it in the boat. And you're kind of like struggling to figure out what to do with this fish. And I think there's a lot of that that happened where okay. it's like my, my bosses weren't really cyclists. So they didn't really understand like mm. why we didn't cover the tour de France or like, <laughs> like, or, or, or no, or like why we don't review specialized road bikes. And it's like, uh. we're like this weird, I mean, dude, our logo is like a, fucked up made up animal like it's <laughs> you're not like you cannot expect uh, this to be like a normal medium yeah and so yeah. because of that like lack of like uh i don't even it's not a, it's not like they needed a plan but just like the lack of uh, understanding about what they were going to do with us they kind of like allowed us to just do our thing which was awesome and um so but uh, uh, you know it's not the silk parachute I thought it was going to be like, I'm still working from 6 AM until like 8 PM almost every night. Um, I've got a team of the editorial staff is amazing. We've got Mm -hmm. a guy in, in uh, Tempe, which is like kind of outside of Phoenix. His name's Josh Weinberg. He's a great photographer, great storyteller. Um, And then we've got this woman from Boulder, Haley Moore, who's like, awesome just really brings like a level of professionalism to our like kind of incoherent ramblings <laughs> he's a copy editor and copywriter and uh f- photographer and 
she races like does these crazy like 600 mile bike races and and oh, finishes in like the top 10 and stuff Jesus. like she's super fit um her partner is like really famous like trail runner guy too so they're always out just doing these big crazy efforts that's awesome but um it's like, it's yes yeah, so we get into like the, it, it really is yeah. yeah we get into like the weird knit little like gritty parts of the industry that that i think traditional companies and traditional media companies don't cover. Um, but ultimately I think to answer your question more succinctly, I think, uh, the pros closet did a smart thing and that's acknowledging our audience and our readership is a very engaged and dedicated group of followers. And if you, if you do something like crazy, like, I don't know, just switch the editorial content, you're going to spook the fish. So rather than doing that, which is what I see time and time again, when, when a company sells, they just let us do our thing. And that freedom showed our, our readership that like, Hey, like this company cares about the Radivist. So like, we don't, you know, we're going to support the Radivist still. We're going to buy the merch. We've sent, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers to TPC. And I think that's probably what the company mm -hmm. was after anyway, which is just kind of like new, new, um, customers. Okay. Um, especially when you look at like the price of like what it takes to get a, a set of eyes off of Google onto your website, it's about five dollars a head. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that's an ROI right there. Yeah. Um, and then we got to do some really fun projects like custom bikes, and we designed some bikes and did a bunch of video stuff. And, and that's, yeah, that's fun. That makes it worth it, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, my job title is the director of special projects, but I still I'm like my hands still touch the site like a thousand times a day, you know, like, so, but I just have more, more helpers now, which is great. Yeah. Letting your child blossom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like that's, I just rode that today. That's a really fun. That's cool. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Just my friend Todd made that bike, the frame and fork and did the paint job. And then a bunch of my other friends made the components on it. Um, so it's, it's like when I say it's like a family, yeah, like the derailleur was made in Whoa. Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's way different than what I'm writing. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Audio this is, listeners this is like, have to put eyes on this thing. That is crazy. Yeah. It's, it's this company, Ingrid Components, and like they make these <clears throat> derailleurs that are compatible across like all platforms. So, dude, this is uh, like looking at the wild complications and movements and stuff on watches. Like, oh, yeah, the equivalent, you know? Yeah. 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 That's like a so friend of mine cool. machine, these cranks up in Philly. It's just it's cool because like every every part has like a human that has like made it in a shop and then sold it because, you know, everyone needs to make money somehow. And um, these people have just made a living doing the thing they love. And, and honestly, like they're the best at it and probably in the world, I'd say like, um yeah, it's just, and then, you know, I, I'm, I know this guy, Adam Moore, who like shoots like crazy watches. And I, I, I met him through bikes cause he also rides bikes and like looking at Adam Moore's photography of these like crazy watches, like Hodinkee's done some stories on him and stuff. It's like the same kind of thing that I do with bikes. It's like every yeah. little transition, every, every, every little nuance. Um, it's calming. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, it is incredibly intense, like the intricacy of some of the stuff that's on here, but like, it's calming to see it the way you've shot it. Like, yeah. You can see the energy that's been put in. People, into. people also tend to do like watches and cars comparison kind of thing. I think the parallel might even more be bikes and watches. Oh, for because sure. Because it's the care, you know, the number of components is fewer but yeah. the importance of each component is higher. Yeah. You know? And it's a really simple machine, right? I mean, yeah. that's like, that's the thing that like is kind of frustrating watching the like electronic car thing happen because it's like, that's not that that's literally not saving the world. It's saving the auto industry. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's saving you know? shareholders and investors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like you want to talk this right here, what you're looking at is the greenest form of transportation humankind has ever invented. And it will always be that way. Mm -hmm. And, and the thing that sucks about it is like, you're taking this very simple mode of transportation and also sport 
And like now there's like batteries on a lot of them, which is great yes. for, you know, I, we have an e-bike we use for cargo stuff. Like we do all our grocery shopping on it, but it's like, yeah, you see these like 16 year old kids riding an e-mountain bike mm -hmm. and c because quote unquote, the, the climb is really hard. And I'm like, and then, you know, their parents dropped them off at the trailhead and I'm like, geez, right. man, like. I remember pushing a one speed like <laughs> up a little tiny little hill like years ago, you know, I don't know. It's just a weird, it's a weird thing to see like the, 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 the science muddy something really simple. Yeah. 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 Well, but I, I guess it's beautiful. It, it was like CNC machined aluminum. Yeah. He did that in shop in his shop too. Yeah. Yeah. This was kind of like a, it wasn't, I don't want to say it was a flex, but it was definitely like my friend, Mike Cherney, who's a jeweler that lives up in the state of Jefferson, um, which is like Northern Cal, Northern California, Southern uh, Oregon made the, the, the little stem cap. And so I sent the stem cap to Todd, the frame builder and was like, I just want some kind of like motif based on Mike Cherney's little design that he made. Mm -hmm. So that's, but yeah, it's just a lot of like weird parts and when you start looking at the vignettes of each of those components and and you'll start to notice like the similar motif through the frame like todd does a lot of like circles intersecting arc like arches and and then like a very just s m redneck inspired stem which is like an old bmx stem um or roughneck sorry not redneck but Beautiful. yeah it's i mean i love this shit it's 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 cool That's and it's so cool. engaging and yeah, like people people see modern mountain, full suspension mountain bikes and don't realize that like you can still ride bikes like this down those exact mm -hmm. same trails. You're just not going to be going as fast or, you know, which has its benefits for sure. Hey, I'm um, a huge proponent, uh, proponent, proponent of taking it a bit slower. You know, the yeah the car industry especially is such a freaking boner over the faster everything is the better it is because yeah ultimately that's what what sells you know the next version of something versus the prior um but like dude like stop and smell the roses you know like yeah <laughs> slowing down and looking around and and taking things in is what it's all about and you know that's not everybody's mojo but yeah i'm on i'm on your uh, i'm on the same page here it's a set. Yeah. Like you said, with cars, I mean, like you go to like, I'll be out riding in Gemini bridges or like somewhere out in Moab or somewhere in Canyon country, like in that Colorado plateau. And it's like some dingus saw a Ford Raptor commercial and thinks that he can go 70 miles an hour down a dirt road in a national park. Uh... I like really got to stretch his little like Fox suspension out. And like, you're like riding a bicycle up, up, a 13 mile climb mm -hmm. and suddenly there's a guy like with his car completely sideways coming out of a turn and you're like well if i were in a car with my family like you know in a jeep or a forerunner or something like we'd all be dead but but it's just like the the speed <laughs> yeah the speed thing is just such a bummer it's like yeah oh like socal was horrible with that stuff like you'd we'd be in like a you know our old like even this this winter we we went out into the mojave and into death valley in our land cruiser which is like 1985 troop carrier super slow well it's you know it's, it's got a cummins r28 in it so it, it's got a little bit of pep but um slow slow by like trophy truck standards and it's like <laughs> yeah yeah people just like pretty much all dirt roads on public land have a 25 mile an hour speed limit and like you just see these people like driving like you're driving through a nature preserve going 70 miles an hour. Like, come on, give me a break. Those people should be shot. Dude, honestly, I hate guns. I, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of violence, yeah. but people doing shit like that should be shot. I mean, honestly, just this stuff, like at a certain point, when you, when you start going to other places in the world and you start visiting these like really fragile environments, like I, I'm all about putting gates up around that and like requiring people to take some kind of like, you know, questionnaire or a quiz or something about how to properly behave. An ethics and morality test. Just, just like, yeah, like <laughs> signing a waiver saying you're not going to do these things. And if you get caught doing them, you're not allowed to go back. Like it's, we're in a society, yeah. like this is public land. Like it should be safe for everyone. Not just like whoever's got $150,000 to blow on like some, some pickup truck with some long travel kit. Like it's, 
it's it's kind of funny. And I know that would never fly in America, but like, God no, especially like take when you start looking freedom. at freedom. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, take take away our freedom to to live. Ugh, I just but threw no, off it's the side. it's sorry. No, it's 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 cool. We're we're doing like this big, like we're doing like a big video project about um, habitat degradation and and like deserts and how it affects uh, how it affects your ski season to your rafting season to your fishing season and how it's all interconnected because of basically like the decimation of uh, biological soil crusts and you know crypto soil is one thing, but yeah, I mean it literally is. I would say partially responsible for the fire that happened in the SEMA dome where it's like Mm -hmm. everything is connected when these like dry and arid landscapes and something as insignificant as like bio crust or cyanobacteria, you, you might not think is, is doing that much, but all that stuff is, is connected. Um, yeah. So it's kind of trying to look at, look at those things without like shaking your finger and trying to educate people, but like trying to just show like, you know, this is why this is happening. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, but it's kind of, it is a bummer to see that, see those landscapes kind of thrashed by human use. Yeah. And it, it's such a, it's such a controversial topic in the, especially in the off-road world, because it's, it's like the realization of things like climate change, which is, you know, yeah. whether you follow the politics one way or another like there is a human impact on it and it's in turn inhibiting what people who want to enjoy these hobbies have to enjoy you know but then i i'm 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 biting my tongue we're not doing politics tonight that's not how (laughs) no 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 i'm gonna call it shut my mouth i I think it's just kind of like the and I don't think, I don't think, uh, you know, um, the human condition of like, just wanting to share things like the societal construct of, of, um, government, I think is, mm-hmm. you know, everyone we're in America, we're in a democracy obviously, but, um, you know, public lands are like the largest socialist experiment that this country has seen, maybe second to the highway, but, you know, national parks, BLM, Mm -hmm. like national forest, like this is all government owned and government operated and government. And this is everyone's stuff, you know, a friend of mine makes a bumper sticker that says public landowner. And yeah, acknowledging that all this stuff is just stolen from the indigenous communities, but like, it's actually like, Like, that's a fucked up thing. Yeah. But like, still like, it's our, it's our, it's, it's our responsibility to treat this place with a little bit of care so that our, our grandchildren or, I mean, I don't have kids, but like, so my neighbor's kids can like enjoy it. And mm-hmm. um, there's just this like domineering dominance of like, you know, flex your muscles, drink your monster energy. I'm going to go do donuts in a dry lake bed. Woo! Thing that happens that yeah. like, there's, you're like, yeah. Too, Sometimes those traditions just got to die. Too much yeah. enabling. A lot of enabling in every yeah. capacity. Anyways. Um, Sorry. <laughs> we're not, we're, hey, no, talk I, about I, I agree. enabling. We just enabled each other on this one. Uh, yeah. We, let's really just. Do you want? Do you want to talk about the troopy? Let's we, talk about. We've the mentioned troopy. it a couple yeah. times. Yeah, that's where I was going. Yeah. <laughs> talk talk about my uh, my immigrant car. You know that I brought from Australia. My my uh, the the car that I brought from Australia so that I could retire in the Southwest and and all of its medical bills that it's since accrued. Similar um, climate. So yes. Yeah, so, so since talking to you guys, I blew the engine, which, right. <laughs> which probably had about 800,000 kilometers on it, which, yay, Toyota, um, Toyota. Um, and then <laughs> I dropped the Cummins R28 in it. Um, the shop up in Belgrade, Montana called Overland Cruisers did the conversion. Uh, this was the first, to our knowledge, 75 series troop carrier with a Cummins R28 in it. And man, the Cruiser Illuminati, like the the old guard did not like a 2.8 liter engine, much less a Cummins engine made in China in right. their precious Land Cruiser. But if you saw this year's announcement, the 70 series is getting a yes. 2.8 liter turbo diesel. You can see that. Same, very similar kind of design as the R28. That was the same same day announcement as the 250. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. It's like a small displacement diesel. But who 
who would think that it would be as efficient as a you know inline six? So that's been around? obviously, in other markets, you know, small displacement diesels are like everything, especially in Australia. Um, yeah. Why? Why? And Toyota does have some of those, you know, moderately small to medium, you know, displacement diesels. Why? Why the Cummins when there's other engines that probably would have bolted up and been easier? Well, Toyota doesn't have really small displacement engines. They have a one HZ, which is like an inline six. Mm -hmm. They have yep. the like in in terms of something that you could just buy, like order a block, a, you know short block and build it up oh, from Toyota that, directly. Yeah, that limits it. And then every version of the 1HZ, like the 1HDT, the 1HFT, the 1HFDT, like all, all of the, you know, mm -hmm. all of those engines. And the problem is to get one of those. So if you were to go to a cruiser shop or even like your normal mechanic and order every single part you need from a 1HZ engine, mm -hmm. you're looking at at least $28,000 just what? for the engine. Because you can't buy a crate engine from Toyota. They do not sell crate diesels. So your option is, you know, get a shop like... That is uh, my friend, fucking crazy. My friend owner works at a shop down in, down in Elgin, Arizona. And they like literally do this for people that have a lot of money. Where they buy the short block. They build everything up. Everything's built to spec. And they drop it in like your, your 80 series or your 70 series or your 60 or whatever. But mm -hmm. it's like a 50 to $75,000 job. Oh my God. So oh, the way I look no. at things is the, obviously like it would have been sweet to keep it Toyota native, mm. but I'm also like not really that much of a car freak. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm more of a bike freak. Like I would, I, I would have a hard say. time building up. <laughs> yeah. I would have like a hard time <laughs> building up a 1983 Richie with non-period correct parts. Then I would dropping like a, you know, made in China Cummins R28 engine right. in a, in a, 85 Toyota. So for me, I'm in, this is Cummins country. There's, there's, there's way more Dodge Cummins mm -hmm. equipped trucks here than anything else. Um, there's small displacement diesels. You're basically like working on a Jetta. So any shop will work on it if they need to. I haven't re really had a single problem with yeah, it. Uh, um, Cummins actually ships or assembles and ships those out of Farmington, New Mexico, huh. which is like over like kind of close to the Navajo res. Um, so it's Lauren, it's, it's like Lauren Healy's neighborhood. Yeah. 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 So there's like all this, all these reasons that went into it. Plus it's only like okay. $6,500 with everything, including the gas pedal. Like, um, what kind so, of electronic the amount of, pairing did you have to do? Uh, I, I literally, it's like an ignition wire. Okay. Yeah. Like, that <laughs> that makes a lot, a lot more yeah. sense. <laughs> It's, it's super sick. Like you take your, it helps if you have a pre ECU, like a pre like pre OBD2. You know, yeah. 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 And I mean, I'm, I'm also greatly simplifying this, but <laughs> you take out your old engine, you chop off your old engine mounts, you weld in the new engine mounts, you get everything squared up. You use the adapter plate. I kept the original, uh, H55 trans and split uh, transfer case. Mm -hmm. Uh, you do some fab work for your radiator and your, your front mount intercooler because top mount intercoolers are stupid. Um, <laughs> Super. and then, yeah, I mean, it's like the dumbest Sorry. thing. Let, let's put an intercooler where the hottest part of the car is sweet. That, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so these guys up in Montana at, at Overland cruisers did all of this work, all the custom air box fabrication that was required, all the front, it's their custom front mount intercooler. They basically used my truck to develop a 70 series kit and they've done a few since then cool and the base of that swap is about twenty five thousand dollars for for the engine for all the the fixtures all the bolt-on everything like you know eight yeah, maybe hvac fab yeah like all that stuff 25 grand boom you've suddenly got a, a old car with a bunch of uh new technology in it well they started tearing mine apart and realizing oh yeah, remember when you were saying your drive shaft was binding from uh, going into four low? Yeah, well, your your rear diff was a four point one, and your front diff was a three point seven. So, uh, yeah, and then, dude, it was just like every day, like a different thing. Like, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, like this is wrong. So, it, I think my bill was like forty ish thousand dollars, but oh, man. Oh. yeah, no, it wasn't. I don't know. It wasn't definitely wasn't that much. Never mind. I take that back. <laughs> 
Yeah. I, oh, I got to look at it because all they ended up doing was putting the diffs out. Like front and rear diffs got replaced with with a uh, ARB air lockers, nice. okay. which we were going to do anyway. And then the engine swap. I don't think. Yeah, they didn't have to fix the replace the transmission or anything. I did that later. Why ARB <laughs> and not Eden? Uh, I, no opinion. Shop opinion. Either way. <laughs> Shops direction. Availability. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like electric electric lockers. Like I've had them before, and um, you know, honestly, like my ideal situation would have been the the OE cable actuated lockers from the seventy series that has like a there's like a lever and yeah. you just pull the lever and it goes. Like air air lockers are finicky. E lockers are finicky. Um, ARB is Australian. Trucks Australian. I just. Enough. I think enough people, okay. enough people trust ARB. Um, but then, then, okay. So fast forward a year. So I had the truck back for a year, getting great fuel economy, like on a, on a tailwind day, getting 30 miles a gallon for Woo! a 1600 pound brick on a headwind day, getting 18 average. Still, average, still yeah. awesome. <laughs> average is 25. My truck. Yeah. I did like a, a, 400 torque 200 horsepower tune on it so it 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 actually i mean for being a big brick it, it moves so we drive we drive Sounds it out like- to um Colorado, or california to the mojave driving down a bunch of like crappy mojave desert roads and um it it starts raining nonstop, and like we're just you know basically camping in rain for a month and the Fun. importer that i bought it from must have done a horrible bondo job around the windshield and I didn't notice this at all until, and like all the washboard, it's a combination of the washboard road, the corrugations. And, you know, I air down to like 15 out there Mm. and the topper cutting the roof off, putting the roof conversion on it. And then the a pillars in the, in the first few years of, of Toyota 70 series were the metallurgy just wasn't there. And Mm. so they, they were already weak. A lot of the Aussie 80s or the 1980s, like 70 series will come with like gusseted plates to strengthen them. So basically, like there was just a shit ton of Bondo around the windshield frame and all the rain had caused it to rust. And so like we got home from being on the road for like two months and there was just like rust forming the cowl and the windshield. And um, so I just ordered brand new A pillars from Toyota, uh, which they have because they still make the 70 series. Like even the new one is just a new front clip. Mm-hmm. It's the same exact body that yeah. they've had since yeah. 1985. That is weird. So I ordered. It's, it's it. It's like the most genius thing that you could do as an auto manufacturer is take the same. You basically are just making different bodies and bolting a front clip onto it, and then using the same engine. Mm-hmm. And it's like the it's Toyota at its finest. Yeah. Whatever. It's the but, Fast and the Furious series. Yeah, yeah. The exact I mean, same shit, just re, like yeah, reskinned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I dropped it off at in May. I dropped it off at a body shop in Flagstaff. Um, these guys just they only do Land Cruiser body work. So, um, and then uh, yeah, they cut out the A pillars. Like I wish I had some photos handy I could show you. Uh, cut out the A pillars, and then found the cowl was rusted. So they like oh. fixed the cowl because they don't make the cowl anymore. Mm-hmm. And then while they were doing that, I was like, well, you know what? Like if, if the A pillars and the cows are rusted, the runners are going to be rusted. So go ahead and cut those out, ship them the, the runners. And so they did runners front to back, both sides, complete new windshield surround. Hmm. And yeah, I'm just waiting for them to finish it up. So hopefully I'll have it by um, May. <laughs> <laughs> a year for a project like that in a small eclectic specialized shop isn't terrible no i and you know like i'm i don't need a car like not not in the summer here i mean we didn't we didn't the whole reason why we dropped it off this year to get done was because last summer was so amazing that it was like 75 degrees and like monsooning every afternoon and we were like well if it's going to be like that again this summer we should just stay at home mm-hmm. and so i was like well let's just drop the troopy off and like we'll have it for the winter we go down to baja or california or wherever and then, of course, it's like the the butthole hot summer. It's been right. miserable, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's been like like it never gets like ninety <laughs> degrees here. We're at seven thousand feet, like we get monsoons, like and it and it was like two months of straight ninety degree weather, 
And then the week that I go to Portland to shoot some bicycles, it's like 70 degrees and rainy and perfect. And then the week I get back, it's like back to being butt hot. That's Murphy's so. law of uh, <laughs> yeah. existence. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, that's the whole reason why we moved to Santa Fe is so we wouldn't need a car. Like it's flat in town. You can do all your errands on a bike. Um, so it's been, and then I've just been doing a lot of bike touring, like, you know, getting my fishing and my camping in off of my bicycle instead mm-hmm. of my, my big turd of a Toyota. <laughs> do you have a, uh, do you have an, I did find the e-bike too. Finally. How, yeah. The e-bike's <laughs> sick. So I presume you have at least a couple in your personal collection. So how do you choose what bike to ride for tasks? Because if you want to go, you know, hike or camp or something, you, I'm willing to bet you have a, at least a couple you can pick from. Yeah. So um, I think like when, well, first of all, I, I've i worked in the bike industry for 18 years. And, and of that time, I've documented a lot of mostly like custom bikes and a lot of crazy bikes. Mm-hmm. So I've met a lot of really talented people in that time. So whereas a lot of cyclists will have like one or two bikes and they try to do everything on those one or two bikes, I've like evolved. And I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing into having very specific Tools, specialized bike. tools for jobs, not, not from the brand specialized, but just like, yeah, yeah I have a, yeah. I have a big touring bike that has a three inch tire, 29 er wheels. It's all titanium with a steel fork, yeah. tie bars. Like it's got front and rear sure. racks, That that's my touring bike. That's what I take on like single track touring okay. or dirt road touring. And, and then I've got my full suspension mountain bike that was made by a guy in the UK, uh, this frame builder called Starling cycles. It's like a, you know, 160, 140 millimeter travel, 29er. That's pretty much what I ride almost exclusively here in town mm-hmm. uh, just because our terrain's so messed up. And then I've got a bunch of vintage bikes and then like some some like kind of around towny, like a towny bike with like a basket on it for like groceries mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, and then, uh, you know, then I've got a rigid, that rigid mountain bike, you know, for when I want to get like beat up on the trail a little bit. And I've got a hard tail mountain <laughs> for d- bike. For days for when, when you I feel like you hate help. yourself. Yeah. 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 Hard totally. tail over here. So I totally get it. Yeah. 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 Hard tails are, yeah. <laughs> I've never really I, I love hard tails. I just, tail. so yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I've got kind of a bike for everything. And, um, but honestly, like all summer, I pretty much, we rode the e-bike around town to do errands. And then I rode my full suspension mountain bike just about every day. Mm. And that was pretty much it. Unless I had a bike to review or something. Right. So, yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, you just, every ride is a different experience. Yeah. Depending on the bike you're on. It's funny that you keep mentioning specialized because their marketing department's headquarters, or at least like domestic or regional headquarters is in the town over from me. Like, Oh yeah. I could be be there in 10 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got a bunch of friends that have like worked there in different capacities, and then the guy that designed that e-bike that we were on, I've been friends with since like 2012 or so, mm-hmm. um, and he's he's he lives in like I think it's a uh, Borby, Sweden now. Oh. He's like back in his home country, um, working remotely, doing uh doing design work for them. Hmm. That's a that that bike right there has probably more. Like you go and you take the top of the line track or specialized or giant or whatever, and you put it against this thing from 1985, this thing has way more technology for its time than, than the modern, modern equivalents. Like I was going to say, is, is this the one you mentioned earlier about only period correct on it? Yeah, this is, I, most of my, I, uh, all of my vintage bikes are pretty much period correct. Like this, yeah. there's these, I don't know if you guys have heard of the brand WTB. Nope wilderness trail bikes there they started off with these two or these three guys and two of them built this bike for a firefighter in uh i think fairfax california and it fits me perfectly but the two builders had a very different approach to frame construction one of them aired on very lightweight very like kind of like nimble minimal his name was charlie cunningham and then the other guy was more about the form and the ride feel, and that's Steve Potts. And so Charlie Cunningham and Steve Potts built this bike together. Uh, like Cunningham built the stem, and then Potts and Cunningham built the fork. And in terms of like the vintage bike nerdery, uh, Cunningham is like getting a 
I don't even know, like a Shelby Cobra. That's right? literally like, what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, like super small batch. like, And then a, a Steve Potts is probably getting like a CJ7. Or, yeah, like a Scrambler. Scrambler. Is that a CJ7? V8 CJ8, yeah. Eight, CJ8, yeah. <clears throat> so, and yeah, it's just Cunningham primarily worked in aluminum and was doing crazy things like hand filing down uh, cassette cassettes to make the shifting cleaner and just machining everything. And yeah, this, this thing is what it's real special. What's on the uh, below the seat. Chris, can you uh, punch in? Yeah, that's that's uh, the original. Yeah. That's the original dropper pose. It's called a height, right? Um, so you, you loot, you open the quick release on the, the seat clamp and you sit down and the saddle drops hmm. and then you close the quick release and the saddle stays at that low position. So when you're going down like a fire road or some rocky stuff, and then when you get to the bottom, you just open the quick release up and the springs back up to your normal height. That's genius. Yeah. I think, I think Breeze and Engel made those and I think they came out in like 1983. Jesus. So. Yeah, that's like the first dropper post. But it's like, it's, you know, the brakes were made in Richmond, California. And like, you know, they, they were taking these ultra lightweight road racing hubs and like flipping the outer flanges around and machining them and and repurposing them so that they were light and stronger. And then cutting down 700C wheels into 26 inch wheels and like re-welding them and just the the amount of innovation that happened in that first 10 years of the existence of the mountain bike will surpass anything that humans will ever be able to do with the bicycle. And I've just gone down this crazy rabbit hole of doing stories and builds from all these like pioneering builders in that, in that time. And it's been super fun, but yeah, that's, I mean, anyone that knows anything about vintage mountain bikes knows that this is like the, that's the creme de la creme right there. It's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. There's even like a mo like a little moped scooter, uh, oiler, uh, fucking fair. I forget what they're called, but like a little <laughs> oiler elbow, like that I repurposed as a cable uh, yoke to get the brake cable to go in smoothly underneath the stem. So I like went to a, a little moped shop here and like bought this little Yamaha oiler and sat there with a file and made it work. And <laughs> yeah, it's just it's funny to me because like you know people were riding pretty much the same single track on these bikes that we're all riding like full suspension on. Right. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like four wheel and a solid axle thing with crank up windows is kind of how I, you know, and I think that's why I love vintage Forbies. you know, I, I, I like the old vintage cruisers and mm. Forbies, and don't really want something with like electric anything that tracks. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. There's part of me that was like, you know what? A little e-motor here wouldn't hurt. Oh that, yeah. That feels like a slippery know. slope though. Like, no, I mean, you know, like cycling's got an inclusivity problem and I'm not just talking about like, you know, people of color and women. I'm talking about like the average person that just wants to go out and get a bike and go experience mm -hmm. what it is. And like studies have shown that people that have e-bikes actually ride more than people that don't because it's not as it's dude. It's, every time I go on a bike ride here it is a, kick to the throat it's it's hard yeah it's yeah. it's not even yeah. even, it's 7, even like thousand feet yeah i mean and i've lived here for a little over three years now and and it's like it's it's still very hard to ride a bike and it takes all spring and all summer to get into the shape that i'm in right now mm -hmm. and then the winter comes and i can't ride for three months and it all goes away again yeah. and it's and and you know i think people would like cycling more if they tried e-bikes and um even just for commuting around town, like we, did, I think the only time we drove the truck, like Carrie's got a 2001 Tacoma. The only time we drove that thing was to go get like a, a yard of gravel or like, like we'll go pick up a cord of wood right. and yeah. that's it. Right. And it's like, it's really, it's really cool and it's faster and it's good exercise. And yeah, people ask so many questions about it. Like we, you know, loading four bags of Trader Joe's groceries into this thing and, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I love it. And I, I think, I think everyone that tried one, if, I mean, obviously depending on where you live would, would definitely end up using it more than their car, which I don't know what that means for the, for automotive journalists, but Hey, I, yeah, I think 
other than dropping my daughter off at daycare, I could probably do everything that I do on a daily basis with a bike. Yeah. yeah. And they make a long tail version with a kid seat too. But it, <laughs> that the risk with that is like you're basically like beholden to the behavior of other drivers. Yes. Not That's... around here. Not good. Yeah. Not good. Yeah. I, don't I mean, think it's good anymore. Here, good. It's yeah. I mean, like the other day, this this like punk kid that I know just from him doing the same shit to me has a giant lifted, you know, twelve valve Cummins pickup that his daddy probably gave oh, him, no. and like drive like drives around in like pit viper shades, telling oh. anyone on a to to move or I'm gonna run you over. Can you fit your head and, in the exhaust or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like 16 year old kid, right? Yeah. She calls Harry like the B word and says he's gonna run her over. And she just like rolls straight up to him and like tells him off on camera, like has the whole thing recorded and, you know, just kind of lays into him and gets his license plate number and all that stuff. And so I just looked up where he lives and like, <laughs> all right, if he does that again, let's go. Uh huh. We'll go have a word with his dad. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's just a weird, it's a weird machismo thing that happens here. They see you on a bike and they just want to like fuck with you for some reason. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. That's. That always sets me off as like if it's a big diesel truck too, and it's popping all the black smoke. I'm like, it, yeah. you've literally made your diesel more inefficient with less yeah. power for a oh, visual yeah. display. But like it it's, makes yeah. their pee pee bigger. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I, I figured out how to turn the screw on my VE pump. Oh look <laughs> at me, I'm a magician. Like I can yeah. I can add more fuel to it, and especially when like diesel is like seven dollars a gallon. Yeah, like, right? I don't get that at all. Like, like more idiots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, like that. Yeah. What was uh, one of my uh, God? Who was it? I don't even remember. It might have been a comedian. But so I was a middle school teacher back in the early 2000s in Florida when No Child Left Behind came out. Oh, yeah. And and so like I had George Bush at the federal level and I had Jeb Bush at the state level. Like, so I got double Bush. And so like they would like one would raise the standards and the other brother would like go like and it would go. It was a nightmare. But what came out of that was a comedian their day was like, maybe we should have left some of the children behind. Like, maybe, maybe we should. Like, like, yeah. That's just the world we're in right now because yeah. we brought all the idiots with us. Yeah, it's man, it's hard. Like having like Gen Z friends, and I'm I'm like Gen X. Technically, I'm Gen X, but like I'm probably my experience is probably more hardline millennial. Like I'm born in '81, I'm 42. Yep, I'm um, right there with you, but I'm in '80. So <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like you know, like dark room. You want to shoot photos? You're gonna go yep. to dark room. You want to. If, if you mouth off to someone at the skate park, guess what? You're going to have to fight them. Yeah. <laughs> no Instagram, there's no text messaging. Like, you know, like just the way that I think we were raised to. And I, I, I like I grew up in like a hardcore metal scene and we got in a lot of fights in the mosh pit beating up skinheads and stuff. Like I don't condone violence. Like I, I will do everything I can to like not get to that point. So I'm not trying to tell people that like go around and beat people up. But like there's just a way of communicating through complex problems that. I think it's really hard for Gen Zers to do. Like you can't, no one wants to sit down and have a face to face conversation, right. like not in a confrontational way, but just like, Hey, let's, let's go get a coffee. Everyone wants to like talk about really complex issues in like 18 paragraph long text messages. And it's just uh, not, yeah, that is not duty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's you can so many, it. I'm not reading more than three sentences. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it's <laughs> almost like a whole generation that is just like <laughs> lost the ability to do what, our generation would just consider like real simple, basic societal <clears throat> structural thing. You know? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, not to completely, you know, cast a bad light on an entire generation. I've already done it to the entire state of Texas and this state of Kentucky. So I probably- <laughs> well, <laughs> well it, it's weird. Paul, Cause I, like you see I, it. I <laughs> being where I'm at on that spectrum, like I'm, I have gen alpha now, like those are my kids. Oh, so yeah. like, it's even is that wilder? Oh, yeah, Gen Alpha is like 2011 is when it started. Hmm. So Gen Zers, I think, stopped in 2010, and so 2011 Dude, starts Gen Alpha. I couldn't even watch TV growing up. Like my parents would not let me watch TV. Like not for any like weird religious reasons, just because like they're like go outside. That's what kids do. 
Right. And that's then, what we yeah. what, that's what we all did. Like if yeah. I got TV, it was Saturday morning or if it was after school before my parents got home because yeah. we're that latchkey generation. Like you let yourself yeah, out yeah. of the house kind of stuff. Uh, my favorite stat on all that stuff was in those cartoons, something new had to happen every seven minutes to hold the kids' attention spans. Oh, wow. And then we roll that into early 2000s video games where something new had to happen every seven seconds to hold their attention spans. And now kids are glued to their phones all day. It's like now it's like I'm going to watch what maybe two seconds of a reel and decide if I want to watch it or not before I'm on to the next one. Like it just we're our brains are all wired different now. It is not the same. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty apparent with uh, like the friends of mine that have kids, like just watching how they behave and when what they like what they respond to, like yeah. me a block, like not even like not even a full Lego set or not even like a full something, but just like, here's a block of wood. Like, yeah, go do something with that. Like, well, you can't do that anymore. I can like, tell you the loudest my daughter shrieks isn't the TV, isn't the cell phone. It's when we open the door in the morning and somebody's walking their fucking dog down the street. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So awesome. at least there's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's why we have a show about so, camping and get them outside so more. Fun. Like we, the, the, the lake and the mountain biking, oh, like didn't look at his phone at all for like eight hours. I mean, that's the thing, man. Like parents, if you're listening to this and you don't take your kids camping, I don't care where you live. You can camp anywhere in this country. Like even New York city has camping and Jersey and upstate and stuff. Like I can't begin to explain to you how important that is because my parents never did that shit with me. I had to like go with friends, you know, to go do stuff or like their friends' mm -hmm. family would take me and like, but like, I never did that until like I was old enough to basically go out and do my own stuff. And like, yeah, it, I, but like, I, at the same time, like I loved, like I used to breed reptiles in high school. Like I was, I was a fucking nature nerd. Like I wanted to be a herpetologist, like up until like applying for schools and you realize, oh, to get into a biology program, you have to have like, a 5.0 GPA yeah. and like AP science, AP sports. bio, AP chem. Yeah. 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 Which is why I was doing all that stuff. I just didn't have the, I was more creative minded, but anyway, like I, the world, like first time I went out West and saw like the American deserts and saw like a Chuck Walla lizard in the wild or a horn lizard, it just like completely blew my mind. And yeah, yeah, it's yeah. As parents, it's like, I can't even begin to describe how, how influential, being outdoors mm -hmm. can be for, for, for children, like, uh, literally shaped me who I, who I am today, just watching nature on TV. Cause I couldn't go and see it. So yeah, it's, um, it's really, it's gotta be really cool to be able to shape someone's life through like how, how you raise them and what you expose them to. And so oh, like it's, that. it's a little weird too. Like it's, oh, wow. it's a lot of, a lot of weird. <laughs> a, yeah. Ross, you're only a year into it, buddy. It's going to get it's, weirder. <laughs> it's already a lot weird, dude. We tell our teenagers. <laughs> oh man, yeah. yeah uh, all my friends that have like kids that I've watched grow up now. It's it's like pretty. It's pretty wild to see how fast they grew and yeah. how how old we're all getting. Well, <laughs> so talk about teenagers real fast. I heard something the other day that uh, like the current teenagers. So those are what Gen Zers there's a lot of resistance to like the normal things that like Gen X and millennials strive for. So like in high school, like there's less drinking now. Hmm. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. totally. The, yeah. I mean, and there's like less driver, well, less driver's license obviously has been obviously. a big one that people talk about, but like, they're just <clears throat> yeah. not, they're not interested. Like, and there's a hesitancy towards adding technology to their lives. Now they're starting to be like, no, yeah. that's not working out for me. Good. They, they didn't even need a Butlerian jihad to make that happen. That's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's a deep cut. It is. It's a deep cut for the sci-fi nerds out there. Yeah, that was the. I mean, we were in we were in Palm Springs and like, you know, walking pretty much everywhere and like just kind of doing the Palm Springs thing. And I was like so stoked to see so many kids on like electric, basically like the, whatever those hot what are those little Honda like rascals like. Basically, Rockets. like an electric motorcycle, yeah. like a yeah, they got like, compo. <laughs> like, yeah, like literally, like a long tail, like hand throttle e bike with like four people on it. Right, right, I'm like, that is so smart. Like, why, like, 
I know, I know you guys do a lot of like auto journalism, but like, why get a car payment? Why get insurance? Why get a driver's license? Like, if you can yeah. just get around with a e-bike and do everything you need to do between that. And I saw tons of kids taking like the city buses and I'm like, man, I, I really feel like, like that generation sucks that they're going to get a giant hot stew of a planet, but like maybe <laughs> they'll actually be able to get something done. You know? I feel, like, feel like some of us are trying to fight that fight. It's just not. Yeah. Really yeah. Good. I mean, every time I go out on my bike, I'm trying to fight that fight. Yeah. And it's yeah. like acknowledging that some boomer white dude's going to yell at me about being in the road. And I'm like, whatever. It's, yeah. 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 Well, we'll be dead in like two years. <laughs> it, my favorite part of that is you can't respond back and say, this is your fault for the way you voted, dude. Like we wanted to have city planning. We wanted to have all this stuff. Yeah. You guys pushed us this way. Like, yeah, that, that's the hard part. Generational blame is like, it's like the frog in the boiling water. Like mm -hmm. it, they didn't realize what they were doing. And then by the time scientists started telling them what people were doing, it was so politicized and yep. that, you know, people had their they're, minds they're still, set. yeah. And it's, yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. I think like this town in particular, we get a lot of like retirees from like California and, and Texas. And it's like, talk about very polarized opinions on across the political spectrum. Yeah, there, but California yeah. is, I mean, they all unite in their hatred of the bicycle. That's for sure. That's <laughs> not ideal. I really want to join the, join the right and the terrible. left. Like just talk about bikes, right? and, man, people get pissed. That's it's, well, well, it's like, anyway. but not just bikes, but like public transportation. Like we just yeah. move away from the automobile for a little bit, guys. It's okay. Like yeah. I, I live in the middle of nowhere. When we talk about like the only way you can get anywhere is air travel. I would love to take a train somewhere. Oh yeah. I yeah, can't. 100%. It takes yeah. four days. Like I can drive it in two. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's it's like we were in uh, we were in uh, southern France, to kind of like a honeymoon, but like really just because we hadn't traveled internationally since 2016. Oh, sounds from like, like forever. Yeah, anyone ever gives me shit about driving a diesel, I'm like, the last time I flew internationally was 2016. I'm talking I don't about have kids. horrible for the environment, international yeah. travel and, and um, commercial freight. Yeah, but what's crazy is like Europe is moving more and more towards rail where you it, it's gonna in the forthcoming in the next few years it's gonna be hard to take domestic flights within europe because if if a train is gonna go say from marseille to berlin like the flights will be canceled mm -hmm. between those two cities hmm. because you can take a train at that so time or you know, like any like this is across european wow. travel yeah this is like uh is it like, like if you want to go like legislation yeah, movement? It's okay. literally like carbon, like trying to like restructure carbon reliance. That's and, great. And, uh, but yeah, so like more, tra more trains are going in, like obviously like better infrastructure. Cities are now, you know, well, not now, past decade have been charging people to go into this, the center cities. Yeah. Like diesel mm -hmm. will probably mm -hmm. be non-existent other than small like ag and utilitarian vehicles. But it's like the the leaps and the bounds that Europe is making, and people act like Europe is like some like like oh they're all just like liberals or they're all like woke or whatever, and it's like oh, no, they're they just know. like they're they just have everything. literally yeah they're they're still very like like southern France where we were is like filled with this like super nationalist stuff like it's they just give a they're shit. still very far right people there, yeah. but like everyone's just like why would we ever want to drive because it would just be gridlock traffic the whole way. Yeah. So let's just make it around easier. And that's the problem with America is we just have too much space. And so people don't see too much ego, idiocy of too much pride, traffic. Yeah. too much space. Yeah. Too, yeah. Yeah. A lot of, we have too much. I, too think, much. I think that's a good point to end on guys. Yeah. Before we like yeah, really, we, we could, uh, <laughs> we could do, uh, I'm going to start writing the bills. Okay. I will start yeah. emailing yeah. State senators. Next week on yeah. you can't even get legal weed in Kansas. I don't know how I'm going to get trains. Uh, dude, that, huh. that's that, another big idiotic <laughs> move. Like, everyone's got to drink alcohol, yeah. but we can't give people weed. Well, that's, the best that's was, completely was politicized a, and nothing else. Yeah, yeah, there was a state senator that pointed to I think Arizona right after they legalized had to spend 25 million in prosecution 
for driving under the influence. They didn't they didn't obviously share the statistic of how much they spend for alcohol related mm, prosecution. Yeah, convenient. But what he left out of his statement was the four hundred and fifty million In that Arizona revenue. made yeah. to then spend twenty five million. Like right. schools, yeah. roads, yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. Like all of that yeah. benefits the rest of us. Yeah, if you're not gonna anyway. tax the one then at least legalize weed and tax the shit. Yeah, exactly. Like <sighs> Well, the Bible says this, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> on which just, day to which guy? Uh, like, yeah. None of those people were on drugs when they talked about giant centipedes coming out of crevasses and burning people. None of them were on drugs. <laughs> None, of them. None of them. Oh, that was peyote. We all know that. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Everyone's <laughs> licking toads back then. <laughs> and then just totally. straight dying because they're poison dart toads. Like just Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody had to anyway. do that the first time and be like, wait, we can do you use that? Like Oh, the amount of humans that are, anyway. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Next, we can, that, that's a whole nother tangent. We can go off on DMP for an Dude, hour. Dude, I, I taught middle school science for a decade. You and I could go on a completely different route yeah. here. Hold like, on. <laughs> Next week on Off the Rails again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's start that podcast. podcast. Yeah. yeah. John and Chris talk science. Uh, it'll be great. <laughs> Rob's politics. Too. It'll be fine. Oh, we'll do that. Yeah. Toss politics and uh, actually, I like. You need to control. I've I've exactly. Yes, yeah. Ross, you can be our liberal uh, coastal elite control. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, I, I have <laughs> a go. minor in geology from my undergrad degree, so. Oh, uh, uh, there you go. Isn't a real science. We all know that. Eat shit. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that's the all Big right. Bang Theory thing. Uh, that's not me, Ross. I, I actually have yeah, rocks, like, like, like literally on my desk. Right I like now. geology. <laughs> Which yeah, yeah, dude. I, no, I like do I leave yeah. when we when we moved out of our house. I was like, why do we have 50 bags of rocks? Mm. Like Carrie, like is a, she's a rock hound. I get it. But like, dude, so many rocks. Yeah, I, it, dude, it's insane. My problem my, is my more rocks. I collect them and don't mark them in any way. So I'm like, I think this one of thousand is from this trip. So yeah, what my oldest has been a rock hound for years. And I have told him when we travel, you can bring home one. And okay. I have one flower bed that every time that's where he oh, puts that awesome. rock and so like that's i have one idea. fancy looking it's kind of eclectic now because we've kind of been all over the place but there's like seashells and stuff out there too that's right? awesome yeah. that that's, is such a great idea i need i figured like instead that. of saying no all the time if i limit it to yeah. one yeah it's manageable well if you ever make it down into the great state of new mexico i have a rock hounding place that i can send you and it's, oh, it's I, surrounded by cracking stuff because it's in the san juan mm. basin but there's like we we were using petrified wood like the size of a five gallon bucket to hold down our like our little ground covering like tarp thing that we yeah. lay out like it was just petrified wood agates jaspers all kinds of crazy like sea Dude, turtle shell all this crazy stuff like just laid out like everywhere that's it's, awesome yeah. that's again awesome. low population density and no one really cares about that shit so. <laughs> Dude, it, New Mexico has been on my list for a while. Like we were supposed to go last summer and then the fires kind of canceled our yeah. trip. But uh, yeah, yeah, main, mainly because it's super fucking similar to Colorado and nobody goes there. Like it's, it's literally the same. It's yeah. like, yeah, except our chilies are better. And I boop, 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 boop. shots fired. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> great with uh, spicy stuff. So yeah, <laughs> you know. that's the thing. Green chili in New Mexico isn't spicy. Well, not what? all of it. Like. The really good stuff is sweet. Yeah. Wow. Like Escondido. Yeah. All right. Hold on. I'm, I'm coming, man. I'm I'll, yeah. okay. I, I'm good with a long drive. So I need to go to sleep. All right. Bye, guys. All right. Yeah. I'll wrap it up. Chris is so, real close. Uh, rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. We were live tonight. Uh, there were some people who were watching. So I forgot to tell John that. <laughs> we were oh. like, nobody. Joel, Joel's not. Joel must be busy. Our Joel's on a family trip in Australia right now. That's why he didn't log on. Um, you can follow John at. Huh? He's in Australia? Yes. Yeah, we have a buddy who lives down in... Uh, Our good oh, mate. Shit. He lives in Melbourne, but I think he's visiting family in Gold Coast I, right now. Melbourne. Melbourne. It's yeah. Melbourne. Melbourne. I don't Melbourne. do voices very well. Yeah. So, yeah. Clearly, uh, you can find... Oh. My, <laughs> my daughter talks in exclusively Australian slang because she watches too much Bluey, so... Oh, yeah. Yeah. The other day, she was like, Dad, where are my sunnies? And I was like, that means something, and I should know. Sunglasses, that's what I'm looking for. Like, I, yeah. 
Look, luckily, I also enjoy watching British and Australian TV shows. So no, I can, dude. Oh, yeah, no, on, dude. So. We'll, we'll talk about this later. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't. Ross, like you and Sam could watch Bluey right now. It doesn't matter that the kid's not old enough yet. You guys would, as new parents, would be getting stuff from the episodes. and well, probably, uh, is, is this about a blue tongue skink? No, they're... <laughs> um, I don't know if they're dingoes or just dogs, but... Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Daisy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my daughter Which I've, watched an hour and a half got of TV uh, this week, and it was the F1 race, so... Oh. Yeah, I mean, that's good, too. I, uh, John, I do have a uh, hard punk metal version of the Bluey theme, so I will send that to you, too. Please also send that to me. Okay. I've never even heard of this show, so... Yeah, I, okay. you're fine. You're not missing out on anything, so it's <laughs> total kid stuff, but, like... One minute. It... There are real poignant moments in the show that are there for the adults that are watching with their kids. And so, like, you'll see these videos of these moms just tears because the real life moment has affected them in a way. Uh, And the kid's like, Mommy, it's funny. What do you want? Why are you crying? Like, it's oh, it's the SpongeBob thing where it's like, Oh, that joke was funny when I was a kid. Now you watch it and you're like, Oh man, that was PG 13 plus. Yeah. Yeah. Except that, like, not just comedy like they are tackling serious things that are affecting the adults in ways and the kids are like this is just a fun episode like, i don't know if i can handle that <laughs> yeah my favorite my favorite like reaction video on instagram is like someone watching like the incredibles and like the i forget the mom's name in the incredibles the last girl got, like, big big butt yep and it's like some clip from the movie and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, like that is for sure in the movie for the dad with the kid at the, or just like any of the <laughs> Disney female characters. Like it's like it's just it's like you isolate that two second clip and you're like, oh yeah, of course that that's they did that for mm-hmm. the for the parents. The parents, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The parents. Mm-hmm. All right. Anyway, if you want to see bikes and landscapes, <laughs> and stuff, yeah. I'm at John Prolly yeah. on Instagram and at the Radivist on Instagram. To watch awesome bike photos, which eventually you got to show me how you make the bike stand up on their own. So I'm sure there's a stand involved, but. Yeah, it's magic. I can't. (laughs) Just want to be there behind the scenes. I won't tell anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) There's a guide on the Radivist called How to Photograph Bicycles. You can search and find it. Exactly. I'm going to do that later because it blows my mind. So So it's not manipulating. Um, That's it. Yeah. Yeah.